everyone. This is Kiki Letalien, host of Association Chat. And this week I am bringing a special episode to you. We're talking with a couple of really brave thought leaders who have a pretty good idea about the role that associations can play in changing our future for the better and exactly how we can do it. I hope you like it. Oh, and also I think someone sort of had a, a zen-like water feature on in the background during our chat. So if you think you hear water, just go with the flow. Enjoy the show. So welcome to this week's association chat, which is your weekly online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm your host, Kiki Letalian, CEO of Amplify Growth Digital Marketing and host of this weekly chat that's been around since 2009 on Twitter, Lab, and now Huzza or huzzah. I prefer to say huzzah because it sounds more celebratory. <laughs> so we like to talk about innovation and the future for associations on this chat. It is a popular topic no matter what issue we're discussing. This week is no different, but this week is very special uh, because I have to admit to having a bit of a bias in that way because if we aren't working towards something, toward, towards growth, then I feel that surely we must be dying. And I know many of you feel the same way. And so let me just give you a glimpse into your immediate futures. This chat is going to rock your world. Today, we're talking to two innovative souls who've just released a white paper bravely titled The Association Role in the New Education Paradigm. And it is a paper that is stepping forward. It's backed by research, but it's asserting why associations are and why they should be poised to take on the challenges of today's education to workplace, quote unquote, wicked problem. I love the, the wicked problem. Uh, I hadn't understood, I didn't know the history of that. Reading into uh, the white paper, you discover all about this. Elizabeth Weaver Engel is CEO and Chief Strategist at Spark Consulting, and Shelley Alcorn is Consultant and Chief Edupunk at, at Alcorn Associates, and they are my guests today. Both have a long history in the association space. They both have a drive to make the most out of life, and both aren't afraid to stir the pot when the pot needs stirring. So I think we're in for a solid ride, you guys. <laughs> Welcome, my friends. Thank you for joining me on Association Chat today. Thank you for having us. We're, we're very, very happy, happy to be here. To be here. <laughs> so, so I just have to ask, I mean, just to, to kick this off, why? Why this topic? Both of you are very, very smart. You've written about a lot of things in the past, but why did you decide to take on this topic and why now? Elizabeth, you want to take that or should I? Um, sure, I can I can start us off. Um, so back in, well, several years ago, um, Shelly did a regular series, a vodcast series um, called Association Forecast, where she would gather a handful of people together, give them an interesting topic to talk about, uh, record the whole thing through Google Hangouts, and then post it. Um, and in the late fall of 2012, um, just as I was launching Spark Consulting, uh, the McKinsey Center for Government came out with uh, a report called Education to Employment, Designing a System that Works. Um, and Shelly had gotten in touch with me and said, hey, you know, I'd like to get some people together who'd be willing to read this report and then talk about it for Association Forecast. Are you interested? Um, and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I am interested and would love to do that. <laughs> um, and that report actually ended up being one of the major sources for the white paper. Um, so that was really my first introduction to the topic of um this, this whole problem of education to employment, and it's, it's a multifaceted problem. It's a wicked problem, as we talk about in the white paper. Um, there are some pretty significant issues related to um, what, uh, what students think their education should be accomplishing for them versus what educators think that education should be accomplishing for them. There are some pretty significant differences 
um, between what students and employers think of how well they're being prepared for the workforce versus how well educators think they're being prepared for the workforce. Um, and while there is pretty good alignment um, around the kinds of skills that everyone thinks people need to have in order to be employable, there's a significant disagreement between students and employers as to how well they're prepared with those skills. Um, so, you know, this, this again, is, is a problem that has many angles. We've got an issue of a skills gap. We've got an issue of a disagreement about what the fundamental purpose of getting a degree is. We've got disagreement about um, how well education is doing at preparing uh, students and young people for careers, for the work world. Um, and so in early January of 2013, uh, we had a really interesting conversation about this, this topic in this report. Um, and that kind of uh, put the, the topic in the back of my mind as something I might want to take on in a more organized way at some point. So, you know, I, I do this series of white papers, this um, uh, new education paradigm white paper is actually the eighth as in, you know, number eight, uh, eighth <laughs> white paper um, in the series. And when it comes to actually taking on a particular topic, I basically, I have a running list of stuff that I'm interested in and I wait for the right moment and the right collaborator to appear. I knew, you know, going back the whole way to the association forecast podcast about the McKinsey report that I was definitely going to want to work with Shelly on this. Um, and she and I started chatting at the end of 2015 um, about whether this might be the right time to do this. Um, and we both realized that it was. Um, and so it became the eighth spark collaborative white paper. Wow. Yeah. I have a deep, I've always had a deep interest in education. Uh, I think, um, due to personal history and exposure to higher ed in certain ways, uh, and then exposure to what I see as very compelling educational options that associations provide. Uh, I think we've been seeing um, a breakdown in systems over time. Uh, and to my mind, associations have so much power and they have so much capability and so much capacity and such huge bodies of knowledge uh, that right now we are very much at a crisis point with this mm -hmm. education to employment system. I started researching it in 2012 and have just done a ton of research since then. Um, and all indicators are, number one, there's a big problem. Number two, venture capitalists know there's a big problem and they're moving into the adult education space by leaps and bounds. Yes. And number three, associations seem to not be engaged in the conversation at the level I think they should be. So mm -hmm. as for timing right now, now seems like the perfect opportunity to really highlight this uh, and hopefully get some actionable information into the hands of the people who can make a difference and help people. Well, you know, and I, what I love about this is that I know absolutely that what you're saying is true. Just I, the last uh, American Society of Association Executives uh, annual meeting, we were all there um, and you released your, your white paper and yep. I, I had ended up invited to, uh, I was invited to this interesting discussion that ended up being a, pretty much along the same lines, the same kind of topic that you're, you're discussing with us today. And, um, and it was where uh, basically uh, these very, you know, nice, industrious, smart, uh, intelligent people were, were wanting to talk to some people about the association space to find out if, it made sense to provide some kind of learning platform where they provide some kind of online uh, adult education and partnered up with associations. And so they were trying to like get a feel for whether that would work or not and what that might look like and that kind of thing. So I know there's, there's an intense, uh, there's an intense uh, view of, of there being an opportunity here but it's really crazy. I mean, let's a little bit of background, a little bit more background about what you guys are talking about here. I know that with the education to employment gap, that it, it's, I mean, it's causing all kinds of trouble. Not only is there massive unemployment, but also 
you know, the wor- there are a lot of jobs that are out there where they just can't find skill, sk- skilled labor. Add to that that there's all this backup information that you have about how, you know, there are so many people that are under the age of 25 that are unemployed and that there is an increased chance of violence in places that have uh, more unemployment. And you can see that there is there is a real big issue facing our society today. And so, so why are, why are you asserting that associations are poised to be in a place to take on a role of an important role in sort of being the stopgap there and and, and sort of even more than a stopgap and actually coming in and providing a solution that other organizations, other types of organizations can't. Well, for me, you know, this is the, the definition of a wicked problem is the fact that every time you pull on a piece of yarn in this yarn ball, a bunch of yarn comes with it, right? And and absolutely, educational and employment outcomes are absolutely related to a person's sense of self-esteem uh, mm-hmm. with their ability to, to fully participate in a workforce, feel purposeful and, and intentional about their lives. Um, and what, we, what we've seen over the past number of years, in, in my mind, is there has been this this supposed K-12 system that feeds into higher ed. Mm -hmm. And as these problems have gotten worse, they've removed much of vocational education. They've removed much of how do you communicate in the workplace? You know, how do, how do you, how do you account for things? What's a basic accounting program look like? They've removed a lot of that and pushed this A to G type of college prep track. And and I don't want to sound hostile towards college, okay? Mm -hmm. I really don't because I I believe there is a place for that. However, the post-secondary system that we have is very heavily tied in with funding mechanisms that prevent them from making changes they need to make. They're very tied in with tenure track, with arguments uh, over departmental control, over curriculum. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. They're struggling with the fact that some careers appear and then disappear before you can even get you know, a curriculum developed, devised, implemented, marketed, signed students up for and all that other good stuff. Uh, and so we're dealing with a legacy system that has a lot of stuff in it that is preventing it from the nimble, the nimble way it needs to engage with a new thing. They're also doing a lot of talking right now. I just read a, another huge article yesterday about micro-credentialing and nano-credentialing and how colleges are trying to move away a little bit from the jury track and trying to embrace these things. Um, and so a couple of things. Number one, we've been considered the Wild West, so we haven't been asked to sit at the table because you guys are just a bunch of volunteers. You get around for lunches and you talk about your workforce, right? Um, and there, there's no recognition that we actually have credentialing certification. Not only do we have experience with it, but we are going to be much faster at putting micro-credentialing and nano-credentialing into place because we've already built that muscle. Yeah. Uh, and as slow as they think associations are, we're not hampered with this leg- legacy funding stuff. We can build programs and launch them and get them out there. And if we did it in a more organized way, in a more collective way, in a more platform centered way, uh, I think we would get a lot more attention for it. But quite frankly, we're not nearly as slow as people think we are. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. we look down on ourselves. We've looked mm-hmm. down on ourselves like, oh, we're not really educators. Well, yeah, you are, actually. The, the definition of education was established a long time ago. We are educators. And not only are we educators, but we've got the muscle, we've got the skill, and we've got a need. Uh, and I think we can fill it. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that's, that's interesting about associations um, is that, and we, we talk about this in the white paper, is that we're already intimately involved with the professions and industries that we serve. We have connections. Uh, most most individual membership professional associations have student membership. Um, you know, we so you know we've we've gotten in with the people who are coming up into these professions. We've gotten in with the universities that, in theory, are supposed to be trying to help people get into these professions. We've gotten in directly with the. Um, the employers in our space. We have existing relationships with them that we can very easily um, use to, to go to them and say, you know, hey, 
what's going on in your world? What are you finding with new graduates or with people who are changing careers who are coming into this profession or industry? Where are they strong? Where are they weak? What do they need help with? You know, as you look at careers in this field in the next five to 10 years, how are they going to be shifting? You know, what is our workforce planning looking like for this industry, for this profession? Universities don't have those connections. We do. We already have them. We're already uh, tight with all those people. We already have relationships there. Um, you know, and, and we probably don't use those as well as we could. Um, mm -hmm. But that's just a matter of a little bit more focus. It's not like we have to build something that doesn't exist. Um, you know, the the other side of this is the whole issue of the non-traditional student. We've only ever had non-traditional students. There are no <laughs> associations that have classrooms and faculty and four-year degrees and buildings. And I like we, yeah. we don't have any of that stuff. You know, we only operate with non-traditional students, people who aren't, you know, 18 to 25 full-time students, blah, blah. It's like we don't, those are not our, our the majority of our people. Um, and we only operate in non-traditional settings. Um, mm -hmm. So we're far more comfortable with both of those. It's not, again, universities are trying to move in that direction, but that's not the way they're set up. I mean, I remember when I was in graduate school, and I was doing an academic program, not um, an, an MBA, but we were not actually allowed to be part-time students. If you wanted to be in this academic graduate program, you were required to be a full-time student. Um, and that meant that, um, you know, those of us who were graduate students generally were not being supported by our parents um, who, you know, we might need to actually earn some money to live. Um, that meant that the only way we could do that was with evening and weekend jobs, which meant, you know, waiting tables or retail or things like that. It's pretty hard to support yourself doing that and doing your graduate work. But again, there, there was just no comprehension that graduate students pretty much have to be non-traditional students, you know, for the, for the majority of us. Um, and associations, we don't have to learn any of that stuff. We already know all of it. Yeah. 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 One other thing I wanted to give a shout out to the two folks who helped us write the paper, uh, mm -hmm. Tracy, uh, for one and Polly for the next, uh, because Tracy did a wonderful piece breaking down this micro credentialing uh, and sort of what this new badging looks like, uh, which was fabulous. And Polly got to highlight the fact that the ASAE Foundation is doing the first study that I'm aware of. I mean, believe me, I've been I've been just pounding the pavement trying to find information on this, but try to quantify what our impact is on workforce development mm -hmm. uh, and really do an organized actual study. So kudos to the ASAE Foundation for doing this because this will help our position, we believe, uh, to have the first, you know, evidence-based, evidence-based, uh, stats and statistics to support what we know as people, as professionals, and actually get it out there on paper. So yeah. kudos to you guys. Well, and I think that I, I think that with them doing uh, this additional research, and then with the paper that you put together, I'm hoping with conversations like this one that associations are going to see those opportunities where you know they may be questioning whether or not their their online professional education is something that they should be investing in right now and they should be you know they they could be asking themselves questions about whether or not they should be pursuing that and what that looks like and so thinking about that sort of mindset and where they are and where you see the industry going, um, you know, what about the association executive that's persuaded by your arguments and they want to do something about it? Where should they start? Oh, great questions. Um, and in the paper, we sort of lay it out uh, as to um, specific steps they can take. But the first... <laughs> The first key to anything is admitting that you have a problem. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, it's like, oh, wow, look, it's like there is an incredible societal problem that associations can do something about. And it really takes, number one, owning the fact that you can do something mm -hmm. about it, that, that, mm -hmm. that this is not unsolvable. 
it will be a crisis in five years if we do nothing. It's a crisis already, but it's it's going to be immeasurably worse if we don't. So number one, own it for yourself. Uh, number two, adopt a more global perspective. Mm. You know, this is a round world. And I know we have a real United States emphasis. But quite frankly, our pools have been shrinking while global population has doubled. Mm -hmm. So since the 1970s, we've sort of gone through this navel gazing exercise of why doesn't anyone love us? Why don't people join anymore? Well, well, they do. They do <laughs> join. There's there's twice as many people now that need to join as there ever were. It's like the, the new renaissance for associations is right around the corner. Right. But you have to start thinking about your industry and your profession, not just your members. Gosh, you know what? I mean, you, you have to change that perspective. I just, I love what, what you're saying here, though, because, and I think we can all, anyone who's in this space and who hear, who's around at all, they hear the, the doomsday talk and they hear the people who are, you know, the question of relevancy, which I love. And I love, you know, people like Jeff DeCanya who come back and say, my God, if relevancy is the bar, you know, like, can we set it any lower? Like, what are we, like, are we aiming for irrelevance? I mean, like, of course, relevancy, I mean, given, and then let's move beyond. Like, how can we actually do more than that? And um, I love that somebody's actually saying, no, this, we are at a time, it's, it is going to be a golden age for associations. And here is why. You well, know, I think, I think one of the things that's that's really important um, that you know we talk about in the white paper, and that is something I've actually been talking about with my clients a lot recently, is the idea of um, your community is bigger than um, just your members. You know, we we tend to get wound up in the people who are paying us membership dues, and admittedly, they're an important audience. I mean, you know, like they're they are paying us membership dues, and they expect stuff from us. Um, and we need to make sure we're delivering on that. And that's all very important. But um, our community is much broader than just those people. Um, you know, our, our communities involve every person who is engaged in the work of whatever industry or profession we're serving. And that includes people who are professionals who are not members. That includes people who are students. That includes, uh, you know, people who are educators or trainers in our field. That includes government officials. That includes, you know, a whole, a whole range of people that's outside of just dues paying members. Um, and one of the things that we really would, um, exhort associations to do is to begin thinking more broadly about what constitutes your community. Um, we also need to begin thinking more broadly about what constitutes our community. So uh, associations tend to be very heads down in, you know, well, we're an association of CPAs or nurses or HR professionals or whatever, and, and we're, you know, plodding along serving that community, the CPAs or the nurses or the HR professionals or whatever. Um, this is, there's a, there's a tremendous opportunity here to work more as an industry on the kinds of things that we can provide. And rather than saying, oh, well, you know, the CPA associations have education for CPAs and people who might want to be CPAs, and the nursing associations have education for people who are nurses or might want to be nurses, we say we are the association industry. We represent every profession, every industry, every career that's out there, and we have education for all of them together as an industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And those relationships are going to be more important than ever in the future. I mean, we we haven't been good at collaborating on our own verticals, okay, within our industries, whether it's dental assistants to hygienists to dentists, you know, we, we, we haven't been collaborating on verticals. And now we're going to need to start collaborating on horizontals before we've even got that piece figured out. Because as automation comes in and as employment changes, there's going to be, a, I'm not a doom and gloom person. There is going to be some amount of distress. Right. And, <laughs> you know, it's like university studies are trying to quantify what the amount is, whether it's OECD's 10% of jobs eliminated or Oxford's 47, you know, whatever that ends up having to be, there's going to, there's going to be some pain involved here. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, associations and association leaders are going to be confronted with a new issue that they've never really faced before. And that issue is what ethical responsibility do we have to get our members upskilled so they can lateral out of a profession that's dying mm. and dying quickly? It's not it's not going to be this nice you know thing. The good news is there are going to be eight associations that pop up. Right for the new jobs that are going to be created, but somehow we have to build those bridges. And so association professionals have new responsibilities coming in the next decade that they've never had before. And there's, there's, there's a larger issue here. There, there's a larger historical issue with regards to the whole thing of automation. So, you know, uh, if you go back to the turn of the century, it was somewhere upwards of 70% of people, not the turn, obviously the turn of the 21st century, the turn of the 20th century, um, there, somewhere upwards of 70% of people were engaged in agriculture. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then agriculture got mechanized and now we have a much larger population for which we grow much more food with less than 1% of the population engaged in the work of doing that. Uh, You know, and then kind of fast forward to the 70s when we saw the wave of automation hit blue collar jobs, Um, you know, and now again in the 21st century, we're making more stuff but there are fewer people who are actually involved in doing it because a lot of the work of manufacturing, blue collar work has been automated. Automation is coming for white collar jobs. Um, and actually um, the Oxford university study that Shelley mentioned, they uh, put together a chart of information about um, all different kinds of professions using like IRS classifications of, of types of professions and the percent chance of being impacted by automation. Shelley put that into a fantastic Google searchable spreadsheet that's linked from the white paper. So you can basically go and say, okay, what types of work, what types of jobs are done in the profession or industry our association serves? Now let's go see how likely they are to be impacted by automation. And, you know, there's the whole, and Shelley's right, there are widely varying estimates of um, how many, what the percentages of, of overall occupations that are going to be, that are going to be impacted. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on the low end, they're mostly, I think, talking about these are jobs that are going to cease to exist. When we start getting into that 47, 50% area, it's not that necessarily a particular job is going to completely cease to exist. However, it is going to look dramatically different as a result of automation in 10 years than it does today. So even if whatever it is that your association is serving is still out there as an occupation, it is not going to be the same occupation in 2026 that it is in 2016. Right. Right. You know, I, I just want to bring over uh, a question that Adrian had. Uh, Adrian Seeger, who he's, I don't know if you both are familiar with him. Yep. Hi, Adrian. Brilliant, Adrian. brilliant Hi. guy. <laughs> and um, he actually just posted about uh, some workshops that he's going to be doing. I've had the pleasure of attending um, workshops that he's facilitated before. He's, he's phenomenal and he's a phenomenal human being anyway. But uh, in he, he writes, uh, in July, I facilitated a workshop for Michigan Community College presidents during the Michigan Community College Association's annual retreat. The 24 presidents with whom I worked were keenly aware of the need to match their educational offerings with marketplace needs And they're putting a fair amount of effort into developing new programs and refining existing offerings. Given that community colleges are similar to associations in many ways, though they are encumbered by some political constraints, do you think there could be opportunities for community colleges and associations to work fruitfully together? I absolutely think so. And and if, you know, if you need to look at you know, what part of the post-secondary system really gets this, the community college system is going to be the one that gets it the most because they've been doing a lot of certification and firefighting programs and nursing programs, like more vocational based, Mm -hmm. you know, so yes, I think there are lots of opportunities for that. And I think there are lots of one-off programs that we can point to between an association and a community college that has done very well. The problem is, and, and the new challenge is the fact that we need to think more globally Mm -hmm. because we love the fact that this program is working on this college campus in this area. And that's fantastic. But what about the outside geographic area that's not being addressed, you Mm -hmm. know? And, and so, you know, when we were, um, 
participating in a, in a thing at the Institute for the Future, you know, we heard about the fact that an association got a $250 million grant to set up education and they worked with four community colleges in their local college district to do that. And my whole thing was the association got $250 million and then they just gave it to four people in their area. Like why in the world did they not invest that in challenging, you know, global virtual education? Now, yes, I know certain <laughs> things like, you know, if you're working on a car, you can't virtually work on it yet, although that's coming. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but, you know, physics labs, I get it. You know, there's an economies of scale sometimes with the equipment that you have to learn how to use that, that needs to be in a local area. But I don't think we've thought large enough about what does that access really mean? Um, and can a lot of that be be provided online and then just go to work on, on that particular thing for a limited amount of time in an intensive week versus this whole semester system thing. So, you know, yes, I think there are, if we're thinking creatively and if we're seen as players at the table. Can I be, and, oh, go ahead. Well, I, was, I was just going to say, and, um, and one of the points that we, that we make in the white paper is that this is a global problem. Oh, I saw, yes. Hi, Katie. <laughs> I love that. So one of the, one of the <laughs> points that we make is that this is a global problem. Um, and it's, it's, which means not only far beyond, you know, the, the footprint of a community college system or a state university system or the U S education system. This is something that is, that is worldwide. And in fact, it is a much more serious problem in a lot of places outside the U.S. than it is here, which is an interesting perspective for us all to think about because, of course, there's been an enormous amount of reporting in the news media, particularly since, you know, the 2007-2008 um, economic crash about, um, you know, what's going on with millennials and the workforce and student debt here in the U.S. We have a problem here. There's a much, much larger, much more significant problem worldwide than there is in the U.S. We're in our economy is in much better shape than most worldwide economies are. Our youth employment is in much better shape than most youth employment is around the world. Um, so, you know, just just like associations are not the whole answer all by ourselves. Um, community college is obviously not the whole answer all by themselves, but we all have a part to play. Mm hmm. Well, I ha Polly has a really excellent question over here that I want to bring over, and uh, then I want to um, challenge you to to help walk me through a little bit of, of uh, the solution. Okay, so but but first, let's talk about Polly's question here, and that that is Shelley Elizabeth. Would you say that the workforce develop the workforce development challenges you uh, outlined before? cut across place and career, like new professional through mid later to later career and industries. Thinking about the Mellon grant that the American Historical Association sought to retrain the excess history PhDs produced mm -hmm. recently to retrain them for other careers. So sorry if I butchered uh, relaying that to you, but, but you get it, you get the question, hopefully. Um, so what say, what say you? Um, yes, actually, this is something that cuts across your whole span of profession. And, and one of the things that we talk about in the white paper is the need for associations to work with employers in our fields on this idea of what's a career path in, in this industry, or not even a career path. What are the options in this industry? How, how can you get in? Does it really require a four-year degree or a master's degree or a PhD? You know, um, one of the things that we talk about that that Shelley is really great at pointing out is this whole idea of using a degree as a proxy um, because we don't have good ways of judging competency based mm. on particular skills. So we say, well, you know, it's too hard or we don't know how to do it or whatever. Um, and so rather than trying to actually figure out alternate ways of proving competency, which is one of the things that Tracy Petrillo had written about for us, the whole issue of competency-based education uh, and competency-based measurement of education. Um, you know, instead of trying to figure all that out, we're just going to say, well, you know, you have to have a four-year degree and that's our proxy qualification. And then what we have is an enormous amount of people with four-year degrees where it's required to get into whatever job that is, 
where the job totally does not require a four-year degree in any way, shape, or form <laughs> to do the job. Um, and so, you know, we've got, a, we've got a problem right from the start, right from where people are coming into these professions. And then sort of as you go along, what are the ways for you to advance? What are the options? What are the directions that you can go? Um, how can you continue to build and develop the skills that you need to move in those ways? What are good off-ramps for that profession that could take you into other places? Um, and one of the things that Polly identified, and this is actually something that um, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, writes about a lot, is we have um, a glut of PhDs at this point mm -hmm. in most fields. Um, and so what do we do with those people? Because now you've gotten to the point that well, you have a PhD, you're overqualified for anything that you might want to do in sort of a more entry level way. So what are career alternatives for people if, you know, you're not going to be able to become a full time tenure track university professor or you're not going to be able to secure a position, a full time uh, position in a research lab or, or whatever it was that you anticipated you were going to do when you started that graduate program? And I think we have a real misconception, and it's a misconception that we have because this is the system we have, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're born into a system and the system tells us a story. And then we get to the end of it and we think, God, was that, and we accept the story because other yeah. people smarter than us created the story. Mm -hmm. But really, you know, with Generation X and the studies that have come out of University of Michigan, you know, my age group, you know, white hair and all, uh, is, you know, <laughs> all three of us, actually, but, yeah. <laughs> is the first generation to really embrace this idea of lifelong learning. And I think when we look at the amount of information we're now generating, we're now taking in on a daily basis more information than a person in the 15th century would bring in in a year. Mm -hmm. So if you look at how we've changed, lifelong learning is the norm. The right. idea that you can right. go to 12 years of elementary school and then, you know, figure out what, Call and then you have this four year <laughs> degree and then you're that until you're dead. Like, yeah. like that worked when we died at 45, you know, but right. we may be in the, in the workforce until we're 70 now. So let's not discount liberal arts. I love history. I love, you know, psychology. I love, you know, humanities and all these other things. I don't think it's an either or proposition. I think you can gain useful skills and competencies that you can use in the workplace. And then you can go deep and create a career based on, you know, 15th century manuscripts if you want to. Right. But you have to get the job to be able to afford to go deep on 15th century humanities. So let's <laughs> stabilize everybody so that everybody's economically safe mm -hmm. and they're able Able to eat and they have roofs and then let's not stop let's go and go as deep as we can but let's not do this either or thing it is a, it is a and and both thing uh, but we need to be able to accept that so, so okay so so I yes and rock and I, I mean, you know, it's okay <laughs> But yeah, yeah we're yes. a little passionate about this or just yeah. a little fun? yeah okay I'll, I'll buy I'll buy you know I'll subscribe to your newsletter I'll buy the bumper sticker and I'll give it the office but okay so, so with the association space that we all know and love um you're going to face some pushback there and the challenges yeah. are plenty. Um, there are a lot of challenges that are there and I don't want to be the one, the, the buzz kill that brings up all the reasons why this won't work. Um, I, I am actually by nature, very Pollyanna ish. I, I, I choose to believe uh, to be optimistic and to believe that things can work out and hopefully they will. But, what are the challenges that we're facing here? I mean, realistically, what are we looking at associations having to do? So some of those critical first steps to really get to a point where they're taking advantage of all of the opportunity that's here to, to you know, take on this challenge. Um, you know, what, what go, go oh. ahead. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I think the first, you know, the first hook, quite frankly, that that I that I think we have is there's a one trillion dollar adult education marketplace that you're not a part of. And for groups that sit there and complain about not having non-dues revenue and who are terrified that they're losing members, the idea that you're letting that money sit 
on the table and you're letting the ITTs of the world, which by the way, all their campuses were just shut down and the Corinthians of the world who've been sued and were fined $95 million by the department of education for being, you know, crappy, taking advantage of students for profit education folks. You know, I think number one, if you want to sell it to your board, sell it on the basis of there's money to be made. Not only is there money to be made in adult education, but there are members to be had that we are not even remotely getting to because the system, the feeder system where we used to get them out of is broken. Mm-hmm. So number one, convince your board of the money. Number two, oh, and, it is a matter and just, of- I just oh, wanted what? to pop in on that whole issue. You know, Shelly earlier had mentioned this whole thing of venture capital and private equity money and all that is starting to move into this space. That's why, yeah. because the market is yeah. $1 trillion plus. I mean, there's a huge amount of money to be made here. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's why they're eyeing where we, in theory, already have an advantage. Mm -hmm. The AMSs are not in this for member service, okay? And they're not in it for member databases. They're in it for the money they can make with the LMS that is attached to it. OK, and 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 that is just obvious. You know, when you look at the fact that Lynda.com right. is one of our right. biggest competitors with with competency education was bought by LinkedIn and then acquired by Microsoft. That is a Godzilla that yeah. is not doing it for the goodness of their hearts. OK, they're doing it because there's an economic opportunity here to provide skills mm-hmm. introduce people to employers and make money off of job boards. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Okay. The fact that we're not collectively responding to this is just because we're so in our own little things, right? So, okay. So you've got that competitive opportunity. You've got money to make. The second is there are ways to do this. You have to systemically sit down. You have to define the competencies that are actually required in your career, not the degree, Mm -hmm. but the competencies that are required. You need to build the career pathway. And then you have to upskill your volunteer content providers. Mm -hmm. You can't just let such and such member who served on the board do that workshop at the conference because yes. hallelujah they earned it yes. right thank like you. we need to thank <laughs> we need to professionalize our train the trainer program yes. so that our members and volunteers see themselves as educators not just getting another ribbon on the badge right mm-hmm. and i think if we could do just those things that's it recognize the financial opportunity build a competency track, and then professionalize your train, train the trainers. Even that will start making inroads and the rest of it will come as you get moving. But, but it's not, it's not going to be impossible to do. And you already do it. You just need to do what you do better. Elizabeth, what do you think? (laughs) The other, the other thing that we talk about is this whole idea of um, building alliances. Um, And so we do need to start thinking of ourselves broadly as the association industry um, mm-hmm. and stop doing this as the CPA serve the CPAs and the nurses serve the nurses and the HR people serve the HR people and everybody goes about their business. Um, we need to start thinking about this in a more holistic way um, because when you when you look at the, the white paper is extensively cited, we've got a huge bibliography and there's all this stuff there. I mean, this is like Department of Labor is involved in this and, you know, major research institutes at major universities and all that kind of thing. Um, if if we want to have a seat at that table, we can't just come walking in as, you know, some little association that serves one little slice of one little profession. Um, because the Department of Labor, and this is, I'm going to use these as an example, because um, our case studies, we talk about what the Ohio Society of CPAs and the Maryland Society of CPAs are up to. Um, and they're doing great work. Which is awesome, by the they're way. They're doing great awesome. stuff. But the Ohio Society of CPAs cannot walk up to a, a forum in which the Department of Labor is working with governments of other nations and say, you know, we, the Ohio Society of CPAs all by ourselves, want to sit at the table. That is not going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. we, we have to come together as an industry. And that's a piece of this alliance building. But it's also alliance building with the employers, with universities, with government agencies, on the state level, on the federal level, on the international level. We have to start seeing ourselves as part of a web of actors who all need to come together to address this problem because no one node on that web can fix this. 
We all have a part yeah. to play, but the only way we're going to be able to do it effectively is to work together. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Stumped on that one, guys. I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Hello, ASAE. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, know, like, you know, do we really speak for associations or not? Let me just throw that on the table, everybody. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Shelly's ready. Can you tell? I mean, come on. No, but this is this is so good though, because I feel like um I feel like a lot of the conversations that maybe have happened around tables and in hallways and things like that in the past, and you know, and around some of the the smaller uh, council group meetings and things. I think that finally we're at a place where society and all of the changes that are coming um, for us all, whether we like it or not, it's forcing our hand and it's forcing, you know, organizations like ASAE's hands to figure out um, what those next steps look like. And I just think that, that, uh, you know, there is so much opportunity and it, it looks like such a beautiful thing that's about to happen. And we're right here on the precipice. We're right here getting ready to, to see it all take off. But how exactly is it going to happen? You know, how, how are those pieces going to finally connect? And so I guess uh, we're at 2.50 Eastern time. So I want to ask you, what's, what's the one most important thing? that you think associations should take away from this research that you've done? Elizabeth, you go, and then I'll, I'll back clean up on that. Do something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do something. Um, seriously, because, um, you know, and Shelly talked about this earlier, is we tend to um, downplay our own impact. You know, oh, well, we're just, you know, little associations who are here, and a lot of us are kind of small budget, you know, and so, you know, we're small staff resources, and we're just, we're here to try to do some good things to help our members and maybe do a little advocacy work, and, and we have a lot more power um, and a lot more influence and a lot more um, skills and a lot more abilities and a lot more experience than we actually are giving ourselves credit for. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, stop thinking, oh, well, we're just poor little associations who can't really be effective. I mean, this is a, this is a wicked problem, right? This is a big global problem. It's too big for us. To, no, it's not. Um, it is not too big for us to take on. We actually have some right. really important, unique things that other entities that we, you know, the governments and employers and universities and all, international, all that stuff that we've talked about, they don't have the stuff that we have. We have unique skills, unique capabilities, unique experience that we can bring to bear on this problem. And so we need to have confidence in ourselves and sort of own that, own the good stuff that we have and be yeah. confident in coming forward with, this is a big problem. We can help in unique ways that you're not going to be able to get anywhere else and be bold about saying that. We, you know, we... I went to see Kevin Kelly speak uh, at Institute for the Future a few weeks ago on his new book, uh, 12 Trends You Can't Ignore, or The Inevitable, or uh, The Inevitable. Just look that up. Get the book. Read it. You need to. Um, but what he said was, it'll be funny in 100 years when people look back at where we were standing. We are standing on the precipice of the most consequential change that we have faced since we invented fire and we invented the wheel. And we are the people right here, right now, who are having to make decisions about who gets left behind, who gets invited on the ride, and what is this new society gonna look like? And the question they're gonna ask themselves is, did they even know yeah. what they were working with? Right. And I think the answer is, I don't know that we know exactly what we're working with, but we have a responsibility to help every single person find their place and find the meaning in their lives. And I think that is something that is worth getting up in the morning for. I think it's, I think it's worth fighting for. And I think the longer you sit and question whether you are relevant or whether you are marketing yourselves correctly <laughs> or whether, you know, what, what are we going to sell? How many widgets this week? You know, yeah. you know, the, the longer you sit 
in this place of nobody loves us, we're outdated, we, we can't do anything. The longer you sit there, the more that actually becomes your reality. It's like, I don't know of any more valuable groups yeah. than folks who work to stabilize social conditions, who innovate in the workforce, who know what it takes to be a professional. I don't know of any other group that has more worth than we do. And at the end of the day, if you have a member who says they help me get a job, find a job and get a better job, I don't know what kind of membership loyalty you want beyond that. Stop questioning your value. Stop. You're awesome. You're wonderful. <laughs> we are here to make change. So let's do it. And we're standing on the edge of something we can't even imagine. Yeah. We got to get busy and start imagining it. You know what? I, I, I mean... Could it end on any better of a note, you guys? So this is this is actually I, I love this because this is a call to action for all of us because I feel like whether or not we have anything directly, independently, directly to do with what our association is doing with education for toward the workforce, we all I think at this point in our lives and at this point in time, at this point in our, in our society's, you know, progress, we all have an important role to play to figure out how we can independently, you know, and proactively go about doing the very best that we can to apply the knowledge that we have to solving some of these problems and, and helping, helping to move things forward. Because, the truth is, is that everything that Shelly just said, everything that Elizabeth, what they're talking about today is absolutely correct. And we are, it, it, you're right. In a lot of ways, it is time for all of us to, to be shaken up and to say that where we are standing right now, we don't have the luxury of treading water. You know, we will sink. Right. Sure, if, we, sure. if we don't move forward. And and I think that all of us have to learn how to apply that knowledge that we have in the best, most productive way possible. That is what we should be doing anyway. But that's what we need to be doing now. Well, and, and, so, and oh, here, here. you know, I tend to like to express it that same idea in a slightly different way, which is the idea that we have enormous opportunity that's right in front of us. And all we have to do is open our hands and take it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the same idea. It's just a little bit more positive framing. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I, I, I like operating from a place of being positive and looking forward with hope and anticipation um, and energy and excitement about what we can do rather than being afraid of what's going to happen if we don't. Forget oh, right. afraid of what's yeah. going to focus on. There's this huge opportunity. It's right there. All you got to do is take it. I love it. Well, thanks for joining us for this week's association chat. I want to thank you for having us. us. Thank you so much because um, your time, your expertise is very valuable for me and for everybody here, um, for everyone who's watching live and for, for everyone who listens later. Um, we appreciate it. Upcoming events and association chats include uh, next week, we're going to have Wes Trochlil talking about the bad Yay. word in association land why you need to rethink sales. <laughs> and then the following week, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, communication disruption. And that's going to be for association chat live. We're always live. This is live studio audience. We're going to be coming to you live from Higher Logics uh, headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. And Yay. we have, yeah, if you're able to, if you're in the area, Come into the uh, studio audience. It's going to be followed by a happy hour. So you're going to be able to network with some people following that and ask questions about association chat and whatever it is that you want to, to find out more about. Uh, Rob Lee from ASAE, CMO of ASAE. Um, and Esteban Escobar is going to be there from 5 o'clock films and, and media. And it's just it's going to be a really good time. 
I hope you've had a good time with this chat and I hope that you've learned something that will help you now or in the future. If you like association chat, please consider sharing it with your colleagues and give us some love on social media. And as always, if you wanna continue the discussion, you can join the association chat Facebook group for regular updates on up upcoming topics and special guests. You can also find out more about our guests. You can read blog posts. You can check out contests and events on the new associationchat.com website that is still under construction, but improving every single day. <laughs> I hope you have a great week, everyone, and we will see you next time. All right. Rock on. Bye. It's a wrap. Bye, everybody. Bye.